Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with TRICOM. As an administrative and financial services provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are David Wilkes and Justin Lee. David has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in human resource management. Past professional certifications include professional in human resources and certified professional in healthcare quality. He has been in the drug and alcohol testing industry since 2003 and previously served as the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Microdistributing. Prior to that, he worked in hospital administration in the Texas Department of Health and Human Services. Justin has been with Microdistributing for three years. He attended the University of Texas at Austin, where he played baseball until he was drafted by the Chicago Cubs organization. He spent two years in the minor leagues and then returned to Austin to finish his degree in kinesiology. Previously, Justin has been a sales representative for Xerox Incentive. Microdistributing is a leading provider of drug and alcohol testing solutions for workplace, addiction treatment, government, and clinical settings. They specialize in rapid on-site drug and alcohol testing devices and laboratory services and deliver a complete solution to their clients. Substance abuse by employees can potentially be costly for employers in the areas of lost productivity, workers' compensation injury claims, and increased health care costs. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar, David and Justin from Microdistributing will examine drug testing for the staffing industry with topics including reasons employers drug test, drug testing options and their respective pros and cons, and the biggest mistakes in drug testing. By the end of this session, you'll know the leading drug and alcohol testing solutions for the workplace. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please welcome David and Justin. Hi, everybody. This is uh, David Wilkes. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Justin Lee. Uh, we, we really uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar series and to talk about drug testing. Uh, like to share what we've learned over the years and talk uh, specifically about drug testing as it relates to the staffing industry. Uh, we're, we've been in business since 2000 and in that time we've literally worked with thousands of staffing companies and so we've, we've, we have learned uh, what a lot of the needs of the industry are. Uh, we've also been very fortunate to work with some of the largest uh, corporate and franchise organizations in, in the United States as well. So we feel like we have a unique perspective to offer um, and some insights. Um, let's see, Amanda, I'm not seeing my, uh, my slides. Here, let me let me take the controls here and just click back to your presentation. Okay, thank you. And then um, you should be able to advance the slides. You want to give it a try? I, yeah, I see it now. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. So just kind of to jump right into it, um, the challenge that you guys have um, to uh, and how it pertains to to drug testing. Um, uh, I know it's been slow, but um, the growth in your industry has been steady the last few years, and so there's a, um, and, and we feel it too with our customers. We certainly felt it 
uh, when the recession hit. But um, there's activity and there's growth, and, and a lot of people are, are looking to you guys more and more. Uh, and they have very high expectations. They, they expect uh, when you send those resumes over to be screened, they the perfect person. Uh, I know we're, we use uh, staffing companies here as well, and I'm always excited to see those resumes, and uh, we, we're, no, we're no different. We, we always want to see the, that, that awesome uh, employee. And they expect thorough vetting of every, each and every one. You know, uh, they want, want them to be competent, productive, cooperative, easy to get along with, and, and all that. But most of all, they don't want high-risk workers. And uh, specifically, substance abuse problems. They don't want to be hotheads, cause trouble uh, at work. They don't want people who steal or dishonest. So we're going to talk about one piece of this puzzle: uh, substance abuse and um, drug testing, and how how it can uh, it, that can help. It, Drug testing is a powerful tool to have in your toolbox. Uh, it's not going to stop it 100%. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what drug testing can and can't do. Um, it's very good at what it's designed to do, but sometimes it's not, every, it's not the silver bullet that everybody wants it to be. So with that said, um, Topics we're going to cover today is why drug tests at all, um, some of the recent trends in drug, drug, drug abuse, some trends in the staffing industry as it pertains to drug testing, uh, the options that you have, uh, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons, and how to avoid some of the most common mistakes, um, and then uh, just a brief little about us. Um, uh, what we do, and we'll have the questions and answer session. So the the drug problem today is, is no there's no secret that there's a problem anymore. I, I know that, but there some people sometimes these statistics are shocking when they when they see them all together like this. But there are 21 million current drug users, and by current that means in, people who have used in the last 30 days. And 75% of those are employed. That equates to about 10% of the workforce. And all that at a, at a cost to employers of 10, well, the latest number figure I've seen is $11 billion. And overall costs, when you add in uh, crime, Healthcare costs, almost $200 billion. And we can, we do studies and surveys. Uh, we, we've, uh, can, we can tell you what, what in, uh, industries are affected the most. Um, and some of these Statistics may not surprise some of you, um, but accommodations and food services industries, um, construction, retail are, are among the highest. So you know, ten percent, ten percent and up from that from retail. But some of you may be some of these may be surprising. Education being down near the bottom. But a lot of these industries are ones that are heavily used by staffing agents, um, uh, clients who want to use staffing services. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of these folks in your offices.
by age, it may not surprise you. Uh, the 18 to 25 year old range, about 19 percent of those that age group are are using drugs. About 10 percent of the age group, 26 to 34. About 7 percent of the age group, 35 to 49, and then a little over two, two and a half percent in the 50 and over, although that is increasing as the baby boomers start to hit this, all this age. Um, drug users are more likely to be involved in an accident, file workers' comp claims, utilize health care benefits quit or get terminated, steal, miss, show up late, uh, be involved in a confrontation and just in, be less productive overall. As far as the impact on safety, there have been some studies that have shown that drug users are almost four times more likely to be involved in a workplace accident than their non-drug using counterpart. Five times more likely to file a workers' comp claim. And as many as 50% of all workers' comp claims involve substance abuse, according to the Department of Health and Human Services. And this next statistic is kind of is scary as well, but 80% of those injured in serious drug-related accidents are not the impaired employee, but innocent co-workers and bystanders. A few more statistics. Uh, behaviors that compared between drug users and non-drug users that have been had three or more employers in the last year is more than double. Missing two or more work days in a month, almost double. Um, skipping one one or more days of work in the, in the last month, double. So this has been studied pretty extensively. Um, I don't think there's a lot of argument with the fact that it's a problem, and it costs a lot. To employers. Um, drug testing has uh, been around since the 80s, and I don't have a slide for this, but I do have some statistics I'll, I'd like to throw in here. But back in uh, 88, uh, Quest Diagnostics, which is one of the largest labs in the U.S., started uh, a study, and it's, they've done it annually every year since. The positive rate back then was 13.6%. And that rate dropped every year um, until 19, uh, or until 2005, or until 2013, I'm sorry. The last three years, this, it's been on the rise. Uh, this last year it was uh, 4%, and that's the highest it's been since 2005. Um, this uh, slide right here that you're looking at where it says the positive rate is 4.7, that's for, that's for non, that's the general workforce, that's not, that excludes uh, federally regulated drug testing programs like DOT programs. So it's a bit higher um, for the non-regulated employees. But when you combine them all, that 4% is the, is the complete average. But this is how sort of the, uh, the drugs kind of fall out. I, I, I will note that um, you have to sort of combine the opiate and the oxycodone 
kind of into together. That's about 21%, but make it the, the second highest for the, the opiate and synthetic opiate category. Amphetamine and methamphetamine would be third. And then benzodiazepines, if you don't know what that is, that's like Xanax and Valium. A lot of people who use amphetamines and methamphetamines will also use benzodiazepines to come down off their high when they've run out of their drugs for been on a three day, four day binge, they can't go to sleep. Even though their the high may have wore off, it's still in their system and their their heart's racing and they're exhausted but they can't sleep. So those those usually go hand in hand. Some more statistics. Heroin use, which you've probably heard a lot about in the in the news lately, has increased over fifty one percent in the last five years. Now, I'll say these uh, these statistics that I'm throwing out were gathered over a 10-year period from 2002 to 2013. So it's a it's a good longitudinal study, uh, but it's a couple, getting a few years dated. But I do have some a little more updated statistics to throw in. Um, but prescription abuse is higher than the combined uh, cocaine. All the other drugs combined. And in 2013, there were 46,500 overdoses, deaths, and half of those were from prescriptions. That's more than people who died from wrecks, car wrecks, which is 35,500, and gun violence, 33,500. In 2015, there were 55,000 overdose deaths. But back in 2013, uh, 85 there were 8,500 heroin overdose deaths, which was which was three times higher than it was in 2010. That's why you're hearing a lot about heroin and the epidemic that's going on right now. And also, not surprising, da daily or almost daily use of marijuana increased from 5.1 in 2008 to 8.1 in 2013. So it's no surprising we're having some of these increases in the positive rates the last few years. In general, we're seeing, seeing increases across the board. Cocaine use has gone down. That's a little bit notable. Uh, where crack cocaine and all that was on the rise is now in other areas. So, how are your your colleagues uh, feeling about drug testing? I thought this was an interesting uh, survey that I was able to find. Um, but it looks like most uh, most are doing it to some degree. Forty almost forty five percent are doing are testing everybody. Another twenty nine are testing more than half. So that's seventy four percent are doing all or or more than half. And then uh, another twenty six the other twenty six percent, which is still a pretty big chunk of the industry. Um, uh, doing it less or not at all. We'll come back to that group in a minute on, a, on another slide. Another uh, just interesting question: if, if there's been any change in the drug in the drug testing policies, um, overwhelming majority is the same, but 32 percent are doing it more. Um, a lot of the, although it's kind of anecdotal, the survey, uh, 
there were a lot of comments about medical marijuana, and um, the con part of the conclusion was that the medical marijuana has actually caused people, their clients, to want to test more. Some of you may or may not have seen the same thing. I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, thought. And then 4% doing it less. So this is of that 26% uh, that uh, was not doing, doing testing less than half or, or, or even less than that or not at all. Um, and the main reason they're not doing it is because their clients don't ask for it. So, and as we've seen, you know, it's very, very client driven um, in the staffing industry. Um, still, still a lot of uh, a lot of people out there just doing it based on their client demand. And whether there's whether there's some people that um, just are in a unique niche market or just want to be out of the mainstream. I don't know. There may be there may be some of that, but I think we've we've certainly seen that in our experience that clients are demanding it or or they're not, and comp staffing companies are just following their clients' wishes. And the last slide on this survey was: Has your opinion of drug testing changed? Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with the question about policies. It's almost the exact same percent, 64 percent, and um, that's probably that's probably those two questions are pretty same. People probably answered that way, uh, but the, most of the people felt it was worth it, and then the the rest of the the pie was kind of split evenly. I'm not sure what, what to make of that. But as far as, uh, you know, drug testing in the staffing industry, I think a lot of more and more people are looking at it as a marketing uh, tool um, to test everybody uh, to, as an, uh, maybe a, a competitive advantage over others. So moving along, let's talk about what your options are if you're going to drug test because there's a lot of them. Uh, a test is, is not just a test, and by that I mean there's, there's screening tests, there's confirmation tests, there's saliva, urine, there's different cutoff levels, there's all these specialty drugs out there now. Um, and uh, deciding which one to use can be can be a challenge sometimes. Kind of break it down into different the different uh, elements. The first being the collection. How how are you going to get it collected? Basically, are you going to collect it yourself? Are you going to send them to a clinic? And then. This is not very common uh, in the staffing industry, but there is a third option. You could have mobile collectors come in. They'll come to your site or to a work, work site, and they'll conduct a collection. Typically, those are done when you've got a, a large group. Um, collectors like to have, don't, don't want to waste their time to come out for one or two. They want, they want to do like 50 to 100. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover that more here in a minute, but the, but the next thing is the test method. So your main two options are a rapid test kit or a lab. Um, so each have, there's some pros and cons there. And then what specimen are you going to test? Urine being the most common, the saliva becoming very, very popular, and it's 
but in staffing. Uh, you can also test hair. And I'm not going to go into this, but you can also do blood, you can do sweat, you can test fingernails now. And then after that, what test, what kind of test panel are you going to run? Everybody's familiar with the five panel and a ten panel, but there's different combinations of five panels and ten panels now. You, there's there's kind of uh, unique custom panels. Um, there's expanded panels and uh, panels with designer drugs on them. So there's a lot to think about and a lot of choices to make. And you can mix and match and combine all this, all these together to make to make a system work for you. Just based on on your needs. So we'll just look at the the collection and just kind of compare uh, compare these. But self collecting uh, in your office uh, saves time and money. That's pretty simple. You don't you're not going to have to pay a collection fee to somebody else to do it. And when the person's in your office and you want them to test, you can do it right, th right then and there. You don't have to go down to the clinic. Um, gives you a lot more control over your, over your program because you're, uh, you're the one doing it. And you, you see it from start to finish, usually, in that, that when you're collecting on site. Um, you do have to have restroom facilities. Sometimes your facility just doesn't. Uh, lend itself. Uh, you may be in an office complex with shared bathrooms, and you don't want to be, uh, you know, blocking off the bathroom uh, with other people in your office complex needing to use it. Um, on the flip side, if you do saliva, there's no restroom required. Uh, when we look. When we look at the uh, using a clinic, um, you've got trained collectors. So, uh, not necessarily putting these into pros and cons, but that's something. If you self collect, you need to make sure you're you have a staff that stays trained on how to do collections, um, keep up with supplies, because if you don't have the right supplies, you can't do a test. We deal with customers all the time. We're overnighting things across the country. Um, sometimes for something as simple as a, a FedEx air bill, they have all the supplies they need, but they ran out of air bills, or they ran out of a, a, a specimen bag, uh, which is you know a simple little little thing, but you can't complete your test if you don't have those those things. Um, the chain of custody, which is related to obviously having a, being trained on how to do things properly, um, you can worry a little bit less about that if you're using a clinic. Um, not that you can't train your employees to do it, it's not super complicated. Um, but if you don't want to worry about anything like that, a clinic may be your, your choice. And usually uh, there's a network of nearby clinics. Um, that, that can be located unless you're way out in the boonies um, and sometimes we have have difficulty but um, usually something can be arranged I already mentioned the mobile collectors are kind of needing a large large group to make it worth their while but if you're if you're doing a big job and hiring a lot of people all at one time, that might be an option that you want to want to choose for special circumstances. Because they'll come in with three or four collectors. Um, sometimes they'll even set up uh, porta potties, depending on the facility. They'll uh, they'll they'll make it happen, and they can do a lot in a short amount of time. But the routine stuff. They don't do. So 
once you decide how you want to, whether you want to do it yourself or have somebody else do it for you, um, you, you still have to decide how you, what type of test method you want. Uh, a rapid test versus a lab, uh, there's, there's certainly pros and cons as well. Rapid test, you get an instant result, and they're very affordable. So again, time and money. Uh, most of these devices have been uh, approved by the FDA, which you know, gives them a, a, a reputation of being dependable as screening devices. And you may think rapid testing only goes along with collecting it yourself, but you can specify, if you send somebody to a clinic, you could specify that they use a rapid kit if you wanted to and you could get the results back the same day in most cases. If you're using a rapid test, and we're going to get into more of this here in a minute, but you need to be able to confirm those positives. So you're going to have to work with a lab still. Uh, and rapid kits are not permitted for DOT, and there's some state restrictions some states that restrict rapid kits. Uh, laboratories, of course, uh, are very proud of their certifications and and uh, their accuracy claims, and, th and that's all true. Um, if you use a lab, then your specimen's already at the lab, so if it's screen positive, they're going to be able to do the confirmation right there. You can, you can self-collect and send one to the lab. So you don't have to use a rapid kit if you're self-collecting. You can still send it into the lab. The labs have hundreds of drug panels, although some of the specialized ones are very, very pricey. And the turnaround times can be long, um, sometimes a few days for, for test results. So specimen type, urine, still considered the gold standard, no pun intended. Um, however, uh, there's a lot of things that people try to do to trick these tests, and there, there's a lot of hassle to just trying to get a valid sample. Um, there's a whole lot of collection guidelines that are geared toward just trying to make sure you got a sample that hadn't been adulterated. And then, like I mentioned earlier, there's uh, you may or may not have a restroom that works. Um, I think uh, the main thing to point out of these three methods, the biggest differences are going to be in the collection procedure, the cutoff levels, because they're not they're not apples to apples. Uh, and the detection windows. Obviously, with hair and saliva, you don't need a restroom. Uh, as far as adulteration goes, they're they're uh, very difficult to tamper or, uh, with uh, with these samples. There's product, commercial products, and things like that haven't been proven to work. Um, but saliva has a much shorter window of detection, particularly with marijuana. It's very short. Hair has the longest window of detection, um, up to 90 days. Whereas with marijuana, specifically with saliva, you may be talking about 18 to 24 hours. It's a very big difference. And another difference with the window of detection is with, with saliva it's a better indicator of recent use because saliva is similar to blood. So once you've ingested a, a drug, it's going to be present, detectable, within a matter of minutes. Whereas that's not, not the case with urine or hair. And 
And then you got your test panel that you need to pick. People throw the five panel and ten panel term around a lot. A lot of I've talked to a lot of people with staffing companies and they they don't even know what drugs are on the five panel or ten panel. They just as long as it's a five panel, they they don't care. Um, and they are generally pretty standard, but once you, uh, the five panel is going to cover your primary illegal drugs, marijuana, cocaine, opiates, amphetamine, PCP, methamphetamine. After that, you're talking about adding the prescription drugs, uh, which you've already seen is a major problem. So more and more people are, are going to higher panels. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of different combinations that can be in a 10 panel category. Um, and your your employer your your customer may only care about is it a ten panel they don't but this is a chance for you to talk to them about their options. Um, there are the the rapid kits and the labs will usually have four or five different combinations, or you can add things. Um, Twelve panels and fourteen panels are becoming more and more popular. And a lot of those are adding some of those uh, designer drugs like K2, Spice, um, uh, fentanyl, bath salts, different things that uh, are, are going on out there. But one thing to consider, um, I'll throw this in there, it's, it's slightly out of place, but I'll cover it now because um, People who use rapid kits and then combine that with a laboratory confirmation, a lot of times we see problems with the, those two test panels aren't compatible. So they'll, they'll get a positive on one, one of their drugs, let's say it's oxycodone on their, on their 10 panel rapid kit. And they'll send it into the lab or send them to a clinic and say, we want a 10 panel. Well, at the laboratory, oxycodone is, is typically considered an add-on drug, and so they'll do the standard 10 panel, and it'll come back negative. Well, it, the problem is that it was never even tested for oxycodone at the lab, and we have we run to help staffing companies run down problems. You just have to call the clinic to see what kind of test they ran, um, all that kind of stuff, and find out. You know, it wasn't even tested. So, so that's something to keep in mind. And whoever you work with in your program, if you're combining a rapid kit and lab, you need to make sure that there's compatibility when you're doing your confirmations. Uh, but the designer drugs are nice to have. A lot of them are available in singles. Uh, so you don't have to uh, combine them on your standard 10. If you've got a concern, you can by a smaller quantity. Um, at the lab, they're typically very much more expensive. And this is a comparison table. I'm not going to um, spend too much time on this just for the sake of time. But it kind of compares the, spec the flow of the collection and the cutoff levels. I did mention that, that they're not the same. Um, for example, uh, a standard amphetamine urine is 1,000 nanograms. A standard uh, saliva cutoff level is 50 nanograms. Uh, and hair, it's a picogram. So uh, sometimes we get people that mix and match urine or saliva with a urine confirmation and things like that, and it's not all compatible. So just be aware of that. So there's a lot of information in, in this section here, mistakes in drug testing. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of legal support for drug testing. It's been upheld in the Supreme Court and the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. We've already been there and, and done that. Uh, however, there, if you don't do things properly, you, you, there are liabilities for that. So. We're going to look at how to conduct your program properly and also look at uh, law, federal and state laws. And, and as you all know, you, if you go to court and 
you win, that's great, but if you go to court, you lose. It still costs money. Um, you're, you may lose your insurance. Uh, you, they, they paid out, even though they won for you. Uh, they're not gonna. They may choose to drop you. All kinds of problems, or your your uh, premiums go up. So um, try to avoid that by designing your program to reduce vulnerabilities and defend yourself in court. The most common mistakes, enforcing your policy inconsistently, and that's that's universal. Um, um, you, it's going to be difficult to win if you if you did that. Um, not only that, it's it it kind of gives a freelance attitude to or, um, to managers and supervisors. Uh, kind of undermines the credibility of management. Verbal policies, kind of along the same lines. You need to get a written written policy uh, so that people can't free wheel and um, go on understood rules. Um, those are difficult to defend as well. Fitness for duty policies, you kind of back yourself into a corner when you do that. It's a lot better off just to prohibit illegal drug use, period. Uh, don't give them a, a time and a place limitation to illegal drug use. Uh, reporting drug test results too widely. This is just a confidentiality <coughs> issue. Keep it on a need-to-know basis. Um, you could be sued for defamation, invasion of privacy, infliction of emotional distress, um, that type of thing. Using unaccredited laboratories. This is just kind of gives ammunition uh, for the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, they haven't gone through the scrutiny of those accreditations, and their their uh, their their uh, quality and accuracy studies and, and their policies are just not as uh, defensible. There's a ton of uh, SAMHSA certified and CAP accredited laboratories out there that are good labs. Those are the only labs that we use. Um, failing to maintain chain of custody. Um, it'll create a obviously a a, a, a hole in your your uh, your defense of the test, but we see a lot of times the biggest thing I tell people uh, is when they're uh, especially if they're using rapid kits and they get an initial positive, do not let the donor leave if they're going to send that to the lab. Uh, they need to do that process continuously so that the donor can initial and the security seals and seal up the sample and be a part of that process. Um, that's the, one of the biggest problems we see. And uh, there's not a lot we can tell people a lot of times when they call us, um, but they have to start over. But there's certainly a lot of other, there's training issues around this uh, with your staff um, to make sure everything is filled out, labeled properly. Uh, labs do reject a lot of a lot of tests because things come in inaccurate. Violating ADA, um, I see this occur in drug testing because, and a lot of times it's not your fault. But, uh, you can cut them off. But you're, they'll start talking to you about you get. Well, I know I'm going to be positive because I take this medication, that medication all these kinds of things, well, now they're revealing their medical history to you. Uh, might be that they're on an anti-anxiety medication, and later on down the line, you know, their performance was bad and they got terminated. Later on they come back and say you did it because you discriminated against them because they have a mental illness. 
So um, if you do the drug test properly, like what we're going to talk about in here in a minute, you can cut them off and tell them that there will be a step in the process that they can talk to somebody about their medications, but they don't need to talk to you about it. Concentrating only one class of employee, uh, so if you're only going to test certain job classifications, um, you got to be careful. They could be disproportionately considered a protected class and can trigger discrimination claims. Best to just test everybody, including top management. And over relying on for cause testing can create a, a, a false sense of security. It's usually ignored by the drug using employees, uh, and that's uh, usually more. Program's going to be a lot more effective when you include it with pre-employment testing, uh, randoms, uh, and including your for-cause testing. I saved these last two for last and put them in red because these are the two biggest problems that we've seen. But especially people who use rapid kits, acting on the screening results only, that is a, that is a a screen. It's not a complete drug test. It hasn't been confirmed. You could not defend that in a court of law. If, so if you're getting confirmations, that's good. Good for you. You're doing doing good. Uh, but then people stop and they don't do the medical review officer uh, step. And um, there, there are some states that require this function. Um, I w we, there was a, a lawsuit that we got involved in because a client of ours in Oregon did a screen. They did a confirmation, but they didn't do the medical review officer step. Um, even, even though we were uh, doing that at their, at their instruction, um, we learned we learned the hard way. We we require it now. If we if you're in a state that has an MRO, it's re, we we won't allow you to do lab tests through us unless you do it the right way. So um, the comp the three elements of a legally defensible drug test are a screen, a confirmation at the lab. And the screen and confirmation could happen at the lab. That's they, when you send a sample to the lab, they do go through this process. They do a two-test process. Uh, if you're doing a rapid kit, you're just breaking the screen down on your rapid kit and then sending it into the lab for confirmation and then the medical review. If you've got those three elements, you're 90% you're there, and you can defend that, that test anywhere. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, state and federal laws running low on time. But be aware there's federally regulated laws, and if you've got an employer that has employees in that class, you, you need to follow these laws. Make sure your drug test is compliant. State laws are more tricky. Uh, they're just they're all over the board. Um, every state is different. Some some states don't address it at all. And some have uh, very restrictive laws, very specific about who you can test, when you can test them, where, how, who pays for it, all that. Uh, even some cities have have uh, have laws. And then there's voluntary laws that if you participate in, uh, you can get workers' comp premium discounts. Just real quickly, um, there's 11 states that require state-specific policies. There's 13 states that offer discounts if you follow their their voluntary law. I'm going to move through these pretty quick. But we'll make this uh, slide show available. There's 19 states that require an MRO. And don't get me wrong, 
just because your state doesn't require an MRO, you shouldn't do an MRO, because if you go do go to court, that's the standard you're going to have to have to comply with. Uh, there are some states that require training, and then there's four states that prohibit on-site or rapid kit testing. Okay, trying to wrap this up, just a little bit about us. Um, we're, we're a drug and alcohol testing company based out of Texas. Uh, like I said, we've been in business since 2000. Um, we have a complete line of uh, rapid kits, and we, and we also provide a, a comprehensive uh, services. Uh, we can test for just about any drug that's out there right now. Um, this is kind of a list of them. Uh, our devices are manufactured at GMP, FDA registered uh, facilities. So FDA approved, some are CLIA waived, um, ISO certified facilities as well. And some of all are also approved by uh, Health Canada and are CE marked for clearance in the UK. Uh, we do offer a complete package. So we, we offer lab services, uh, MRO, collection site. We do random selections. Uh, we'll assist with regulatory compliance, policy development. Um, we have a 24-7 uh, hotline. You can talk to a live person. Uh, we do work nationwide and even internationally. We've got a well-trained staff. We've got some online tools you can order online. We have online training modules. You can take a test. You can get your results online. And, uh, and we're very competitively priced. Uh, here's how you can contact us. And that's the end of our presentation. Okay, wonderful. So at this point, we're going to open the floor for some questions, and I will open up a poll for your feedback. Uh, you can use the chat feature, the Q&A feature, to enter in your questions. I do have a couple of questions that have come in, so I will begin by reading those off. Uh, the first question is, if you use a rapid on-site test and it is positive, are you required to submit that to a lab for confirmation only on the positive result? Well, it's kind of like what, what we said in the presentation. We say required. Um, some states don't address it at all. They don't, they don't give a requirement. Some states do require it very specifically. And we could look at, you know, look at look at it by state. But again, like I said, it's it is the recommended way to do it, regardless, because uh, it is a screen. There are cross reactive reactions. There there screening level tests are upper, you know, 98, 97 percent accurate. The confirmation tests are 100 percent accurate. And uh, where screens look for broad brushes, uh, broad chemical signatures, the GCMS will narrow it down uh, to the exact drug. So if you're an, on an opiate, you'll know that on the rapid kit, but at the GCMS, you'll not only know is it an opiate, but it was hydrocodone and the level. So um, I, we always recommend that you, you do the confirmation. Okay. And how do states that have passed medical or recreational marijuana laws affect drug testing? Well, most states still have, uh, are, most states that have passed medical marijuana laws are still employer friendly, meaning uh, policies can still be enforced. Uh, Arizona and New Mexico uh, are an exception to that. Their employers can't deny employment or discipline for positive tests 
for medical marijuana holders unless they can show evidence of impairment. So it's a little bit more, you can, you can do it, but it's got to be more than just the test. So there's an additional um, step that you have to prove. Um, but the thing to know is, I mean, the federal, regul federal laws still do not acknowledge uh, legal marijuana use. And so there's the, the advice is that to continue your policy of uh, no drug use allowed and to um, continue to assert your rights as an employer to be to not have drugs in your workplace. Okay. Can a drug test be beaten? There are some products that work, um, particularly with urine testing. The most effective is, is synthetic urine that's actually temperature controlled because the checks that you have, one of the first uh, integrity checks you have is the temperature. Um, if it's not body temperature, the specimen will be invalidated. So if people bring things in hidden on their body, they can't keep a body temperature, or they add water, anything like that, a lot of times that catches it. Um, but they do have devices that will keep it warm, and, and that's the most effective. There's a lot of other products out there. Some are um, can can be used, can be effective, but not as the synthetic urine is the most most effective. The, there isn't, as mentioned during the, in the presentation, saliva and hair, there really isn't anything that's been proven to be effective with that. The saliva test, you are required to wait 10 minutes before you collect a sample, so with nothing in the mouth. So your mouth is kind of like a self-cleaning oven. It, it cleans, cleans itself out. If you've had gum or tobacco or anything like that in there, or you know some of these mouthwashes that people sell over the internet, things like that, are not effective. Okay. Um, will synthetic opiates show up on an opiate test? Um, yes and no. Um, the standard opiate panel, the cutoff level is 2,000. Um, the, op the standard opiate panel will detect heroin, codeine, and morphine. That's what it's designed to detect. Um, the synthetics like hydrocodone and oxycodone, it can detect those things, but it has to be at a much, much higher concentration level. Um, a lot of people are testing for opiates now at the lower cutoff, a 300 nanogram cutoff level. And that is much better at catching some of the synthetics um, because even though it still has to be at a higher level than 300, it's like you know around 1,000 or 1,200 nanograms it can catch oxycodone, things like, like that. Um, if you really want to be specific on a synthetic, there, there's now a specific tests for oxycodone, which is a, a separate standalone test at uh, 100 nanograms, uh, which is really sensitive. So um, you just got to be aware of what this is what I was talking about earlier: what the test can and can't do, and what find out what test you're getting and what's on your panel. Is there an industry recommendation of what your panel should consist of? Um, there are, you know, health, the folks in healthcare industries are recommending higher panels um, simply because uh, access to those, a lot of those 
people have access to medications. And not only that, it's the safety sensitive nature of it. Um, and, and most of them do choose to do that. Um, after that, it's, it's usually a um, employer's choice on how aggressive they want to be. Um, some people have chosen not to do the higher panel simply because sometimes you, you catch a lot of people who are on legitimate medications and you have to go through that MRO process uh, and sort through that. But um, it, that's the one recommend industry that we're seeing the higher panels recommended on for sure. Okay. Well, we're uh, nearing the end of our time here, so I've gone ahead and placed the contact information on the slide again. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, to either David or Justin or myself. Thank you again for your participation in today's webinar. And David and Justin, thank you for sharing your knowledge on drug testing for the staffing industry. We will have a recording available of this presentation on our website. It is at tricom.com under our uh, Resources Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a wonderful afternoon.